We're getting into films now where there's a lot more visual effects involved. Moulin Rouge had quite a number of visual effects yep. involved in it. Time Machine. Peter, and we're getting up to 2000s now. Peter Pan, Chronicles of Narnia. Let's talk about that one. Well, I mean, all the things you've talked about so far have visual effects, basically what I'd call supporting the main theme. Narnia, they were the main theme. Mm. Um, it, it was it was a uh, a great um, a great experience. Um, three or four months before I was in New Zealand, uh, the director and I would every Tuesday and Friday, amongst a lot of other things, uh, we'd spend the day with the uh, the head of the previous team, who were ten in number, mm. and they were prevising scene after scene, and then we'd direct we'd direct their previous, <laughs> and they'd go back and do it again and do it again. In other words, we had the whole film. Making the whole movie before you make the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, um, it really was um, a great, um, great experience. But we, so we had the whole film virtually as a, a rough cartoon before it began. That's the first time you've really worked like that? that yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, that, the expense of that's something. Uh, Did you find it really helpful though when you were shooting? Well, the the real point was that we probably rarely shot exactly what they we decided for them to do. Yeah. But the real strength of that thing was that every time we deviated, we knew we had to get back to a certain frame that they'd <laughs> they'd drawn, and that it sounds very simple. But if you don't do that, if you just sort of go off and direct the scene and mm. shoot the scene as you want to for the day, if it doesn't lead into the next thing, you're in a hell of a mess. The, the next, the so you're working from put, one visual effect shot to the next, next basically. So, yeah, you really, have to, you really have to, and that, that's, that was the massive strength of it. Mm. In actual fact, it gave us the freedom. People say, but wasn't, doesn't that restrict you? I said, no, it didn't. It, it gives us the freedom to fly, but we know we've got to land so yeah. we can fly again. Right. But if we just keep flying, we'll crash. Yeah, everyone's following the same plan. Yeah, yeah. So what was it like working with the lion? <sighs> well, as I tell people, we we, uh, we tried it with a real lion, but we started to run out of kids. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, um, the, the lion, of course, like half the characters in that, were a, a little doll on the end of a stick, uh, uh, which just gives the actors an eye line to look at. Um, um, and that, of course, um, Mr. Adamson was um, came from uh, um, Pixar, I think. Yeah, he he was a director of uh, animation, mm -hmm. and um, he, I mean, his his knowledge of the the effects the computer side was encyclopedic. Right. I mean, so. You, you, one thing you didn't bother arguing with him <laughs> that was, was that area, uh, and so how was it like working? He, he, he was so he was so um, uh, choosy about the the, the 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 effect being as as good as the technology could make it, and I mean apparently the hair on the line is is like means is you know. At means, the time, means, yes. At was, the time and place was like miles ahead of any other yes. hair that had been on the animal and that, all of which, yeah. I, Until I, Life of Pi, that was the most realistic creature yeah. of that kind uh, that had been yeah, put on yeah, screen. Yeah, yeah. But so how was it like working, doing live action shoot with so many visual effects and so much green screen and so many characters who aren't actually there, they're green sticks? It's, it, 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 it's a whole different process of, I mean, I've, I've just come off this little film in which the, there are some visual effects, but they're, they're, they're background effects mostly. Um, it, it, it goes from, you, you spend weeks and months in pre-production talking to the effects people, the limitations, the possibilities, and the whole business. And should we do this <coughs> and, in and camera and, and, or should and, we do this in post, post and, those kind of yeah, things? Yeah, and it, it's just, you know, we, we, we discuss endlessly and, you know, often gets down to budget. It'll cost 20,000 to do as an effect and it'll cost 50,000 to shoot it. So we're mm. going to do as an effect. And then you debate whether it's going to be good enough. And then if it's going to be better, 
if we shoot it, is it going to be thirty thousand dollars better? <laughs> uh, which all all has to be quantified and discussed and and set down. Um, one of your more, more recent films, again, visual effects, Ender's Game. We're now in twenty thirteen. This is just a couple of years yeah, ago yeah. now. Um, again, another big effects film. Uh, what was it like doing that kind of? Was that how different with Tanani was that, for example, in the way that was approached? We didn't have quite the uh, amount of uh, film previous. Um, we were f- Gavin Hood, the director, and I, of course, agreed with him uh, genuinely that this was a film about um, a drama amongst children, not not a visual effects movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, The visual effects were the vehicle for the kids' drama to happen. And and our our priority priority always was to have have the story, the plot, the the interaction of the characters foremost, right? Mm. Uh, Never negating the fact that we were in this this strange strange location. In pre-production, there'd be be a crew of about 40 people in which uh, the director and I would just endlessly move from one problem, possibility, uh, to the, the other. And you, you, just, you just accumulate so much knowledge and you, you keep contributing, you keep saying what you think, what would be better, and based on your ability to visualise it. and. Um, Sometimes they use that idea, sometimes they don't. Well, that's what filmmaking is, problem yeah, solving. Yeah, yeah, it is. Not many Australian films actually do well in the cinema these days. Uh, they aren't finding an audience. Do you know why that might be happening? I think probably the problem with most of our productions is uh, they're inevitably in going to be low budget. And the films that that really are making money are the the big the big big, 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 big and you know you the same in the states. I mean, how many small films make much money in the states? Not too much. It's it's a real fluke. Uh, same around the world, in actual fact. I'm, I'm I've I've got a theory, and I I don't know how long cinema is going to last. Um, to be honest, because um, I've got my screen over there. Um, it's going to be 4K before too long. It's going to be bigger and better. And um, I, I think something like in the future, like Dressmaker that we've made, w- will be promoted. Uh, and it will come on on maybe Tuesday night mm. at 8.30 all over the world at or market by market, right? and you'll pay your money. So it'll, it'll get back that that films w- will be made for... So we won't even bother with a cinema release. Many I, I, films yeah, aren't no, these it, days. It, 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 it's, it's, if, they can get, if they can get 10 bucks for people to tune in and do that, mm. uh, you know, it, it appears to me to be a much better market proposition than, than the cinema now, the way it's... Do you regret the demise of cinema? You, you based your career on oh, yeah. it. Oh yes, I mean, uh, I, I, but uh, regretting something for nostalgic reasons is silly. I, I, I also believe, in my little theory, is that there will always be cin- some cinemas as almost um, uh, the uh, live performance theatre, uh, dramatic performances now a stage for uh, an elite interested group and they'll always want to go along and and maybe join in a crowd watching a movie. Um, so there's still a small niche audience for cinemas you think? Well I'm, I'm, I mean I'm, this, this is, this is it's, uh, prophesizing which has got always all dangerous. sorts of problems. <laughs> um, yeah no but uh, I, I, just, I just can't see. I mean the number of times you go to a cinema now and there's four or ten or Twenty people in a, you know, two hundred seat cinema. So, uh, what kind of films do you think we should be making here? Having just made Dressmaker, for example, here. 
I honestly don't know. I, I honestly don't think, this is, this is a terrible thing to say, but I, I don't think there's a market for the films we're making. It's um, in the way it's structured now. I, th I think we've got to, got to look at a way of, another way of finding an audience. Is it the for, kinds of stories we're telling, that they're too low budget, <clears throat> people don't want to go to the cinema to see a little yeah, film? I, I, I don't, uh, no big so, star actors? No, but, but most, yeah, most people want to go and see an, an event, and you've, you've got to create that event feeling. And it's very, very hard to do with, uh, with, with, with small films, as you say, without actors. But be, even, even in the States with big actors and all the rest of it, the, the small, low-budget films have got the same struggle. And uh, you know, they've got a much bigger market, obviously, mm. than we've got. So, yeah, it's, it's a, I, I guess a moderate film here still, still makes money. And uh, I, 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 I wouldn't despair, but I, I, think, I think we've got to start to look, somebody smarter than I has got to start to look at what, what the real situation is.